Hello, welcome to another video. In this video, we discuss the Immortal Emperor Crisis and the Nicoythan Civil Wars. Let's begin. So, to first talk about the Immortal Emperor Crisis, we travel back to the reign of Ramalov, Marcellian's grandson. In the later parts of the fourth, not, I mean, during the later parts of the century of the four emperors, Emperor Ramalov ruled the empire. His rule was left lo largely left to his administrators, most of which spent lavishly and themselves failed to administer their respective regions. Despite things, despite things, things were stable until his sudden death. Eventually, Olkar the Brute would come around and cause an attempt to conquer many lands. But when he died, he lost. The throne would go to his second cousin, Heckelson the <clears throat> First. So, what began the decline of the empire d into the later parts of the century of the four emperors, and then in the aftermath? For one, weak and lazy emperors in the in the, the government, where the emperor had a lot of power, the most of power. So essentially, the emperor was supposed to be a powerful figure, yet he really didn't do much and left it to his administrators. Wars in Goldland that would cost the Nicarthans dearly. Now this kind this meant that the Goldlands people were fighting ferociously against the Nicarthan Empire, and the Nicarthan Empire spent a great deal of its wealth, specifically the monarchy, on trying to maintain it, just so that they can potentially extract gold from the area, which is very hard to do. Oh, my bad. Bone-breaking taxes being implemented on the peasants. This meant that now the peasants were being heavily taxed and the production of food and everything would probably go down and everything because taxes were usually paid in food and labor and other stuff. And so these heavy taxes would take a toll on the peasants, not only causing revolts, but also leading to more death due to the fact that peasants had generally less food. <clears throat> and then finally, well not finally, but then there's the decline of the quality of the army, which means that they aren't as... They're, they are still paid the same, but their gear is worse, and their training is, well, less vigorous than before, leading to weaker and more ineffective soldiers. And then finally, just pure corruption. Due to the Emperor not having any real power to do anything, and he leaves it to his administrators, these few administrators had all the power, and they were usually very corrupt. And now, with all these corrupt people, you get all these um, things happening, which lead, which helps lead to the Immortal Emperor Crisis. In the year 576, a man only known as the Immortal Emperor would launch a revolt against the Nicarthan Emperor and declare himself the Emperor of the Ari Empire. This began a series of wars with the Immortal Emperor beating the Nicarthan Emperors in almost every battle. On this map, you can see that what it looked like in 576. On paper, this would look easy for the Nicarthans to defeat the Immortal Emperor, which is this yellow here. However, the Immortal Emperor was a much skilled general. The Nicarthan army was weaker than the Immortal Emperor's army due to the fact that the quality was worse and the training was worse. And also, the Immortal... And also, the size of the Nicarthan army was... Huge, but it was spread across the entire empire, and thus it couldn't actually come to help them, come to help their fellow soldiers, and so you see he wins battle after battle after battle. <clears throat> the Immortal Emperor Crisis, a period of near constant warfare between the Ari Empire and the Carthan Empire, has been mentioned, would be and would end in the year six eleven in the Battle of Etikmar in which the Nicarthan Empire was able to inflict a devastating blow onto the Ari Empire, killing the Emperor in the process, and thus ending the crisis. As you can see on the map, this is where the, the Ari Emperor's army was. Now, the Ari Empire deserves its own video, the Immortal Emperor War Crisis, 
because it is such a detailed and unique event that has happened and well there's way more to be said about it about the politics and the individual wars and everything and so if you if any of you want to see this as a future video make sure you let me down in the comments and I'll definitely make sure to eventually at one point cover this topic <coughs> yet will starve the Immortal Emperor Crisis left the Empire into a period of chaos. The Nikarthan Emperor, Yedelstav, attempted to make reforms. Despite this, nothing major happened, and his reforms wouldn't be implemented. He was a weak emperor at the end of the Immortal Emperor Crisis. In 619, he died without any heir, but with a pregnant wife. In 620, his wife, Katrina, gave birth to five children, one of them dying, leading to quadruplets being born. She named the emperor to be Archeritas IV, who would be the oldest, and became emperor's regent for her son. Now, Katrina herself was very corrupt, and due to um, some of the people who disliked her, this led to the Imvin War. Well, the Imvin Wars, I mean. <clears throat> In 626, a noble named Imvan from Nartha Actually, he was from Marthia, but that's a mistake I made. Attempted to overthrow Katrina. Yeah, Katrina. Let me check the name. Okay. He failed and fled his army to Marthia and thus began the war. The war was guerrilla fighting until the city of Marthia was captured and Katrina managed to capture Invent. He was given a light sentence a light punishment and would simply be banished to Western Marthia. However, five years later, in 631, the Second Inven War began as an army of over 300,000 men crossed into Marthia and fighting would become much more bloody. Four years, fighting would rage until Katrina died. So, let's go back up to the first map. Let's go to this one. So, he flees over here into Marthia and there's heavy guerrilla fighting for years, and then he's banished to Western Marthia where the mouse is. He comes back with armies, mainly given by local tribes, who secretly pledge their loyalty to him. But he really doesn't control them. And then he moves back east, and then, well, the war happens. And fighting would be brutal, including the deaths of tens, hundreds of thousands of people. And so, in three in 635, he would arrive in the capital and attempt to control Archeritas IV. In 641, he was banished from Nartha by Archeritas, who Imven tried to control, thus starting the third Imven War. So you can clearly tell that the Nakarthan emperors were quite weak. As you can tell, they didn't want to execute him, they didn't want to do this, and so they attempted to banish him. And now we get to the chaos that is the War of the Four Emperors. <clears throat> In the year 645, Archibitas' three brothers, Ramelov II, Marcellian II, and Tomarx, found their formed unique different warlord states across the empire. All sides would be fighting against each other in very brutal conflict, leading to numerous battles and the deaths of tens of millions of people. Eventually, in I think 657, I believe, Archeritas wins the wars and dies the next year. So he manages to defeat Ramelov II and then moves down to defeat Marcellian II, which is significantly harder. And by the end, um, Ar Archeritas IV is able to win, but at heavy cost. This war would last for over a decade and lead to the deaths of, as I said, tens of millions of people. And if we look at this map, we can see how fractured it is. You got the Saiyan Rebellion in the north, we got an Algamoran Rebellion, the, the self-declared Republic of Algamor. But then we also have the forces of Marcellian II, no, Ramelov II, I get these names mixed up sometimes. 
over in Morthia, and he actually has a large amount of supporters here, and that's why that's mapped there. But also at the same time, this yellow is actually Imvin, because he is still alive, and he's still leading armies against the Nakarthan Empire. And he's actually technically allied to, not Ramilov, but Marcellian, the second. The strongest one out of all of these, technically, was, for a while, Tolmarx, whose little warlord state was down here. But by the end, his empire would be conquered, and thus the Christ, the war, well, the war of the four emperors would end. And so that's a brief summary of what was going on at the time. <clears throat> but if you think these wars are done yet, welcome the Council Wars. In 659, which is a year after Archeritas' death, a regency would be established with 10 members involved. The faction, the, the council quickly grew fractionalized and saw plots, murders, and eventually war. So a lot of intrigue. In this war, the first council war, all 10 factions other than, well, I, I don't know why I said this war because this is kind of like just referring to a period of time where it was near constant warfare for two for two decades. Um, essentially, to heavily oversimplify, most of the empire, other than the small amounts of timberlands down here and goldland, participate in the war. Now, there are many different sides, but at, in 675, this is what the map looks like with Heckelson the seventh and Yargat the fourth in the yellow, and then there's everybody else in these different colors other than blue and the darker green. Now there are much more factions involved and in fact this gray is actually very misrepresenting of what the actual empire technically controlled under well no states because Algamor was essentially independent, Apir was essentially independent and all these different areas were so far different but there was so much fighting involved and well Tens, if not hundreds of millions of people at this point were dying because of these wars and everything. And, well, you can see the effects here. And then, if you really thought this was over, then we have the War of the Two Empires. After the Council Wars ended, the Nakarthan Empire was split into two. In the Treaty of some name of something, I don't know, I'll create it some other time. In this treaty, you see the splits, you see... In the original deal between Heckelson VII and Yargat IV, they had both agreed to be emperors of the same empire. But after understanding that you couldn't be, they could only be one emperor, they decided to split it up between the two emperors. <coughs> now this doesn't last that long because for one, Heckelson VII hated hated Yarg Yargat the fourth and also wanted some territories located in the center desert regions a dispute over here and thus in 686 war resumes and the war would last for several years before eventually for two years before the Vesmat Empire as it would be called would be killed off Heckelson the fourth seventh Heckelson the seventh takes the south, and Yargat the fourth takes the north. Heckelson the seventh dies, yada yada, and soon enough the empire is fully united under a strong emperor. I use that quotation with quotation marks. And then immediately we go to the War of Love. This is very this is a weird name for a war, but the reason why it's called this is because in the year 688, after defeating the Bismarck Empire, Emperor of the Nakarthan Emperor, Empire, Yargad IV, wanted to marry, in his words, the most beautiful woman in his world. Since his father never arranged him in any marriage, he had to ask a council of 30 people in the Numa family for permission. So essentially, you go to 30 family members, some of which you might not even know of, ask for permission to marry somebody and very often unless it was like a political power thing they decline and of course they declined leading him to just marry her anyways and being banished from the city he would continue to fight them for over two years 
After killing many of the, his family members and then arresting the rest, he would attempt to have children with his wife, Hemania. However, she soon revealed to him that she couldn't have any children, and in an act of honest intelligence and bravery, he committed suicide. <clears throat> and so, we get... And so, with this, the son of Heckelson VII, Heckelson VIII, usurped the throne and declared himself emperor. Now, he was preparing to march into Al Gamora because there was a massive rebellion going on, in his words. He wanted to actually secure his empire, but the people didn't want to leave. And so, sick of war and believing he'd cause another war, the peasants had enough. And being led by a man named Manath which would become later known as the Manathist March, the peasants would storm the city of Nartha and the palace. They were soon joined by the army and local guards, and they killed Hegelson VIII, Himania, and many more people. They killed Himania, by the way, by stabbing her a couple hundred times, and that's not a joke. With all this, a council of five people was established, who were prevented from owning armies. Other than the, un, other than the attempted usurpations of Morpath II and Jarkanth, Jark the council followed this rule. The main job of the council was to find the remnants of the normal family due to most of them being killed during the hundred years. And if you think that was peaceful, then welcome... Oh, just kidding. No, the war has ended here. Now let's ask the questions. Why would this civil war occur? The civil wars. <clears throat> the normal family. The only requirement of being an emperor was to be a part of the normal family, which allowed for a lot of contenders to have a claim on the throne. A system heavily reliant on an emperor in an empire where the emperor is very weak and leaves his administration to corrupt people. The Immortal Emperor Crisis also happened, which weakens the Empire and the Army. And to the next point, the Nikarthan Army was usually a stabilizer, but it was so weak that fra factions would form and the Army couldn't do nothing but watch as the Empire tore between each other. And then finally, many, many people believed that they could become Emperor. This, what I mean specifically by this is that Due to the weakness of the emperor, many people believe that they'd become a better emperor and they wanted the power that came with that position. Now, there were also many other reasons, such as, well, <clears throat> about why such things happen, such as, like, failure of administration, the general spending of nobles, etc., etc., but these are some of the main reasons why the civil war occurs, and other declines. Now, what made these wars so brutal? Faction, f fractionalized groups who hated each other. So, so these aren't just one people leading a army, and it's only that one person who cares, and the soldiers don't care. In fact, a lot of these soldiers, when they fight against each other, they hate each other in this fractionalized system and they're believed and trained into believing that they're supposed to fight against each other which leads to mass death and also the fact that there was no law in place which is something later and so they were also promoted to raiding and pillaging and slaughtering entire groups of people just for being opposed to them <clears throat> starvation mass starvation people couldn't eat food and so when people can't eat food and there's like not enough food to grow, death happens. Disease outbreaks. Disease outbreaks were everywhere. Due to the horrible conditions that armies faced and that conquered areas would face and, well, diseases kind of suck, you see them spreading all across the empire and this leads to millions of people dying. Frequent and vigorous fighting. Now, this in and of itself is bad, like battle casualties or whatever, but, but like, the dead bodies would cause disease to spread due to um, horrible conditions and 
And so the frequent and violent fighting would also lead to massacres and slaughters, which would... It creates a domino effect. Unreliable weather. So the weather is very unreliable, and this is kind of on a general part, because you got very weird weather going on. Like, for example, in the... In the middle part of the 500s, it actually snowed for a couple days in the center desert regions. Now, the snow melted, but the fact that that was even able to happen kind of proves that, specifically, Ari also has very unreliable weather. And this is a major cause for, of course, just life sucking in Ari because of nature is kind of against you. But when paired with the other reasons and the fact that the Civil War is going on, that's one of the major reasons. Natural disasters, such as the the flood of, I forgot the name of the river, but it's a river near Northa, and that river actually flooded in the year 651, and that could have easily destroyed the city. And then there was also the earthquake in Goldland. There was also an earthquake in Marthia. You get the point. There was so much natural disasters that helped kill all these people. And then finally, probably another important one, pure lawlessness. Lawlessness and corruption. You would never be punished for a crime because there was no one to punish you for the crime. And so people could be as violent as they want and, well, get away with it. And so this also kind of developed us also kind of like a weird culture of hating each other in a way. I don't like to say culture but it's just kind of the way that life developed every man for himself is what i meant to say in this area it's literally just every man for himself and lawlessness and everything and this leads to just mass death everywhere and finally the final conclusion in the year 709 a man named elogoblin arrived in the city of Northa with 20,000 soldiers, ironically, and he was crowned emperor two years later. He was actually, he actually wasn't a member of the New World Dynasty, but instead was a member of the New World Dynasty through marriage, which was something you could do in the Nekarthan Empire, and also many other prominent empires too, is marrying into the dynasty. And no, you don't have to be subservient to a female, you just have to, well, actually, <coughs> Well, you could be subservient to a female, but you could also marry off your mother, which would make you... Well, your mother could marry into the New World Dynasty, which would make you a member of the New World Dynasty. Even if your father is not a part of the dynasty and neither is your mother. But you're a, like, New World family-in-law. So, unless your mother gets divorced, um, you're essentially in the New World family for life. And this kind of leads to, well, the mothers would usually be killed soon after they married so that, um, so that the son in question could stay a part of the Numo family for life. And this has also happened in other empires, but anyways, getting on back track, <clears throat> getting back on track. Elogoblin would eventually, in the future, become known as the Great due to his many reforms. He changed the Empire in a lot of ways, which, continued by his successes, would lead to the Second Golden Age of the Nekarthan Empire. That is it. I really appreciate you guys watching this, and sorry about my rants and my stuttering and everything. I really hope you appreciated the video. If you'd like to, you can like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. Make sure to check my community posts as you, as I'll make polls and quizzes and other things. And I really need some people to, even like five people to just go into my community polls and vote on them and do that stuff quite frequently. Just interact with my polls, my community posts. That's it. I hope each and every one of you has a good day or night, and see you all another time.